Um, I, I'm going to just talk real briefly about the approach to doing this. And then because a lot of you guys are still have yet to pull in your traps, um, it, you know, it, it, a lot of these questions will come once you try to process stuff. So we'll just sort of go over stuff and then we'll do uh, more of a Q&A thing. And then, of course, you guys can ask me questions uh, after today or after you've started processing your traps. Okay. So as a quick reminder, uh, you guys all know this, so we're doing this site characterization right now. Um, we have this, uh, uh, how, when, whenever we do a characterization, obviously there's the important qualitative stuff, and then there's the quantitative stuff. The, the traps that you guys are pulling in are the quantitative uh, or, or, or supporting some of your quantitative comparisons. And that, remember, um, Brent, we were just talking about replication, right? You guys need good replication. Obviously, because of logistics here, we have uh, a single replicate in each of our um, sub areas or, or, or regions of our backyard. But in thinking about this and in thinking about how you're going to approach your uh, eventual analysis, when we talk about the quantitative stuff, we're really talking about are things different or the same? And that could either be in space. So does, does uh, the backyard differ from the front yard? Or does Sam's yard differ from Paulina's yard or, or you know, whatever? Um, or it's that one site uh, changing through time. Does, does time A differ from time B? The traditional metrics for doing these types of uh, arthropod inventories, critter inventories, are first and foremost, just say who you see, and you guys are doing that, right? You're going to your backyard, you're, you're learning your plants, you're, you're enumerating who's here, and that in and of itself is, is useful. Um, sometimes we call that inventorying, sometimes we call that species lists, um, but the tools that you guys have all deployed and are getting ready to analyze are going to allow you to do um, that plus additional stuff. And, and this, the additional stuff is abundance and diversity. And Bretton already mentioned this, so I'll just, I'll just touch on it. But, but from CONSBIO or other classes, you guys remember there's, there's three commonly used types of, of reporting out of diversity. Richness, which is just the number of categories. So that would be akin to your species list, how many how many species, although it need not be species, right? It's any number of categories. It could be um, guild. It could be the, the, the type of, uh, you know, herbivores uh, versus carnivores or something of that nature. It could be uh, critters that are flying versus critters that are on the ground. So richness can be used in any way, shape, or form. And, and when you do do these open-ended um, uh, site assessments, you might, you know, Species might be the right thing, but other things could be the right way to, to characterize that depending on what your client uh, is looking for. So richness is just how many categories. Evenness is how evenly smudged across however many categories you have the organisms you encounter are. And then composition, which is probably after richness the most commonly used uh, uh, index of diversity or measure of diversity, combines some amount, and there's many different ones, but but combine some level of richness with evenness. And all of those you guys could generate if you wanted to from your data or you don't necessarily need to. As we mentioned last time, most of our traditional assessments of say arthropods would be taxonomy focused. So how many uh, families of this critter or how many families exist in our backyard, how many um, you know, species, how many varieties, et cetera. Um, but we're really focused today on, and, and with this activity, on more of a taxonomy independent approach. And we mentioned last time why that can be helpful. So here we have some processing. Now, until you guys actually have your samples, um, this is, it's going to be hard. But my recommendation is, and this goes not just for your arthropod sampling, anytime you're doing something new, like your, like your quadrat deployment or whatever, I would do it several times without, um, you know, write down some data, but don't, but don't do it, uh, you know, crazy balls to the wall, every single little detail. Try doing a couple different ones. Um, in this case, you guys have uh, hopefully four different samples. Um, before we really start getting into it, look at the, get the qualitative feel for what's going on. Do I, have, do I have lots of grass in this plot? Do I have not much grass in this plot? Do I have lots of um, tall things in this, et cetera? And that particularly applies to something like we're about to do here, which is something that you guys don't have any experience with. 
and um, and particularly in this case, we're all distributed. So so Brenton can't lean, lean over you. I can't lean over you and say, oh, this is this. And so it's it's even more of a challenge in this setting. So again, I would encourage you guys to just stare for a bit at your traps before you do anything. Just you know, have a libation of your choice and just sort of stare for a few minutes. And sometimes it really does take getting the, you know, training your eyes to see things that otherwise um, would be problematic. Um, for the larger stuff, that's not so much, a, that's not such a big deal. But particularly for the smaller size stuff, that really is important. So if we glance here at the picture on the lower, so here's some students processing traps on the right. If we gr glance at the lower left though, um, uh, in this case, the student has used a Sharpie to help um, him or her uh, uh, divide up their their trap. And there, you know, we so obviously we have some some big flies in there and stuff, and that's cool. And uh, and they've circled a few things. That's a technique that might be helpful. So again, uh, visually breaking your trap into subsections to help you um, work through the stuff. Um, circling certain critters to help you identify um, similar individuals or denote that you already counted them. There, there's no magic way to do this, but you should have a look at your trap and trap or traps and see what, what do you think is going to work best. But for example, the thing I really want to highlight here, first of all, is on that picture on the lower left, there's obviously, you know, big, big uh, uh, insects in there, but then there's these brownish, reddish, uh, uh, little flicks, right? And if we just glance at those, that maybe that's dirt, maybe that's a piece of grass, uh, you know, a seed or something that blew on there. But in fact, all those things are actually arthropods. Those are all animals that we need to articulate. And so one thing that'll really help um, is, uh, hold on one sec. So if you guys can, uh, if you guys are looking at my screen share, I'm not sure how how I do this well. Let me do that. Um, but if but look at my camera now. Don't look at my screen. Can you guys can you guys all see me? Is that can you articulate your zoom so that you can see my camera? All good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So so this is going to be really really helpful for this stage. Obviously, if we're in lab, you guys could use a dissecting scope. That would be great um, and really helpful. So when we're doing this activity in class, the first thing I do is when everybody brought in their traps. I would grab one representative trap put it on the um, dissecting scope and have you guys all come up and look. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in here. And if we, if you, if your particular site really does have a lot of, uh, I don't know, grass or, or dust or whatever, this can be challenging. So you might look at this and say, is that a piece of dust or is that a critter? The, the answer is to zoom in close. So a dissecting scope is great, but you have other tools around that can work. So first and foremost, your cell phone, right? So if you prop up your cell phone and do zoom, you know, or, or not do zoom, sorry, and zoom in on your camera application, that can uh, really, really help. And you can uh, snap a picture and look at that and maybe even blow it up further. So everybody has one of those. Um, but the preferred, my preferred uh, tool in this case would be a um, magnifying glass like this. So you can just take up, take up your trap and, you know, boom, really quickly scan it. And, and, oh my gosh, that, that actually, that thing has legs. Oh my gosh, that thing has some antennae. I, I, I guess that, that's a, a living thing. Another option that most of you guys probably don't have, but some of you might, which would be something like this. These, these are a hand lens or a loop. And these are um, very common with botanists. Uh, the plant nerds really like them. So those of you that know Tom Huggins, oh my God, the guy has like, uh, you know, like most people have, have, have all kinds of entertainment. He has he has loop entertainment where he's oh my god you know he's le some leather thing he made from some something in Borneo or whatever. Anyway, so how these things work is they have um, there's different types, but but they'll be it's a little mini magnifying glass. Can you guys can you see that? It's a little mini magnifying glass and some and if you just did this it's great. And if you want to just look a little bit closely, you can activate this. If you want to get even more magnification, you could bring additional uh, guys in. Now, this one is this one that we have here in the lab um, and that you guys could use if you next time you come to uh, campus or whatever are, is great. It's very heavy. It's metal. It's solid. It's not going to break. Um, and so those are the best kind to get. But you can also get these off Amazon or wherever plastic for very cheap. So so, you know, you always get what you pay for in terms of your optics and your quality. But but you need not spend a lot of money. But having a good uh, magnifying glass or an ability to magnify this is really, really helpful, especially in this first stage. 
What I typically do when we're training students is have them look at their first trap under the, under the dissecting scope, just again, till they get the, the mental picture, the image of, of what the things are. And then once they start processing, usually we don't use the, the hand lens all the time or after the first trap or two when people get a sense, generally we don't use the trap. The last thing before we go back to the screen, uh, to my lecture is, um, I will say when, and, um, well, Dr. A is away, I purchased my hand lens when I was an undergrad for my was California plant tax, taxonomy class. And I bought the, the nicer one, the metal one, and I still use it to this day. I take it out with, with me in the field and it helps with gobies too. I, a lot of times I'll get small gobies. You can sit there, I always have my hand lens on. So it's something if you're going to be in the field doing this for a career, it's good to just invest and it'll last forever. Totally, totally. Um, and so uh, another one that's going to be helpful to you, again, you don't have to do this, but will be helpful, particularly in this exercise, is um, our calipers. We tried to see if we can get you guys some calipers, but it got complicated and we couldn't. Again, just like everything else, you can get some really nice, expensive uh, metal ones that will last a long time. Um, or plastic ones. I always prefer plastic because I learned to use these things underwater and because we work in wetlands and stuff, the metal ones sometimes tend to rust up. So I actually prefer the cheaper plastic ones for um, because I use them outside so often. But again, a couple bucks you can get one of these guys for. So, um, so there's different styles. I prefer this style. This is a vernier caliper. And so, so they'll, they'll be, there's actually three types these days. There's, there's a, a digital, there's a kind that has a digital, um, uh, uh, like a stopwatch type of indicator. So as I, as I move this guy, the, the dial spins. And then there's uh, electronic ones where um, it's, it's actually a, a digital measurement and you can read it off of a, a alphanumeric display. And with the digital ones, a lot of times there's, there's a measurement button, boop, 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 boop. And so if you're measuring a thousand gobies or something, you can just boop, 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 boop. And then at the end, you can plug in and download all those measurements. Um, but regardless, I use, I prefer the Vernier. It's, it's a little bit of an exercise to show you guys how to read these. And it's a little hard with this camera, but suffice it to say, um, I'm going to measure how, how large these individuals are. And that's going to matter. So we'll talk about size in a second when we get back to lecture, but if we just look, if you guys all jump, jump back to your screen real quickly, or, 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 or my, my shared screen, you guys can all see that now again, right? Still? Everybody good? Okay. So, um, so most of the sizes, when we talk about sizes, are going to be pretty obvious, but the one that isn't, the only one that isn't, is this one, again, looking back on the left on this picture, which is those... Th and the picture of the little, uh, these guys, the little little brown, uh, brownish red uh, dudes. Again, if we had a magnifying glass and we looked at that, you'd see that there are appendages, there's antennae and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, those we refer to as reds. And the reason we refer to them as reds is way back when we were first starting to do this, for whatever reason, the grassland we were working in, they were mostly uh, light red, pinkish colored. And so that we, we call them reds. Um, now, uh, since we're not together, how do you visualize this? My best suggestion, so I'm bald, right? Everybody knows I'm bald. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so let's imagine I just buzz my head with clippers. Okay, good. Great. And then we came back in an hour or tomorrow and we rebuzzed my head, right? So if you can imagine, you know, little teeny flecks of hair that are little, little teeny small that were, you know, just clipped a, a couple hours before or a day before, that's basically the size of these critters. Okay, so they're extremely small. All right, so keep that in mind when we jump back. Let's get back to uh, our brief outline. Let me see if I can make this guy a little smaller. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I, I've given uh, Brenton a couple things. This is, this is a tool that we typically use when we're doing a Cam Park or can be helpful with Cam Park. It's one that we built for coastal wetlands, but really works pretty well in our, in our riparian systems in a lot of our local coastal plain areas. So this is a... This is a, posted on your canvas. And it, it, excellent. Everyone knows this stuff's posted on canvas. And, and so this is just a, a guide, right? This isn't exhaustive of every single invertebrate we have in our area. This isn't exhaustive of, of every single family or whatever. It's just the stuff that we commonly encounter. So this, this covers most of the kind of things you guys will encounter. Were we to be doing this in, if you guys are doing this in Camarillo, say, or what have you, 
again, since we're so dispersed across the state, no guarantees this will do everything, but this will still probably get you the, the first couple things. So if you're just curious as to what you're seeing, um, uh, I would suggest flipping through this. And, and again, this is created by your fellow students and is really um, a, a practical guide uh, for this exact thing that you guys are doing for pitfall traps, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's so that that's more of a taxonomic approach. And Brenton has mentioned there's iNaturalist, there's BugNet, there's several resources, even though we're not together, that you guys can access. That will um, they won't necessarily always get you to species, but they will usually pretty are pretty helpful in terms of for those of you guys that are fairly naive about looking at invertebrates, um, really help you get the you know cross the first few hurdles. And so um, so start with this, but by all means use all these tools at your disposal. Okay. So let's talk about the data. So uh, I've, sh I've shared a, a data sheet with um, you guys, and we'll talk we'll, at the end of this, we'll, we'll jump and look at the data sheets. But I just wanted to um, make sure before we actually, you open up a data sheet, I want you to just have a look at what this is. This is the um, sticky trap data sheet, which is much more prescribed. The pitfall data sheet is much more open-ended, which we'll talk about because we are in so many different places and, and some of you might be getting radically different types of critters in your pitfall traps. But for the sticky traps, uh, this is what we have going on here. So this is a data sheet. Now the data sheet is um, laid out in uh, a fashion that uh, might be confusing at first, but is designed to hopefully make it easier for you guys to use and consistent for you guys to use. So first and foremost, the data sheet is um, uh, for every individual trap, every yellow sticky trap, there's two lines. And so let's have a look at this. So the top line, it says, and this would be from one individual trap, so one, one piece of plastic. Obviously, there's a front and there's a back. So the front side, wherever you wrote your date and your site name, we call that the label side. And the side without the Sharpie writing on it is, the, is simply called the back. And so note, there's a, um, a row for you to enter the data from the label side. Finish that one up, flip it over. Then there's a row for you to enter the data on the back side. Um, also on the data sheet, the stuff that you guys are to enter in are blank, right? So those are the cells that are just naked cells, empty cells, and you, you'll type stuff in. If there is a, um, a shaded square with an X in it, you don't fill anything in there. Uh, and so, for example, uh, uh, well, yeah, this will make sense when we look, when we look at it uh, farther. Um, okay, so next I want to talk about the main thing you guys will be doing when you count your insect tri sticky traps. Two things. One is going to be species richness, and one is going to be the morphometric stuff we're talking about. So the species richness is going to be morpho species richness. This is apparent species richness. We all know that there are, um, say, the juvenile stage of, of an insect um, might look radically different, might look like a worm type thing, and then the adult might look like a beetle type thing, right? So, so to do robust taxonomic inventorying and robust species uh, richness counts, we would need to account for that, right? We don't want to double count. For the purpose of what we're doing here, we're ignoring that. We're just saying, hey, if this thing is way bitter, bigger and different colored, I'm going to you know, consider that a different, a different species, right? And so there is some judgment call here, totally. You need to have good light. Sometimes things that look the same in, in poor, bad light in the back of your room, if you went out into bright sunlight, you'd say, oh my gosh, this one has a purple iridescence and this one is actually pure black. So we, we do want to, you know, use our, use our magnifying glasses, use some good light, but, but we're not going to kill ourselves here, right? We're going to do our best job that we think we can and leave it at that. I want to direct yourself to the first two rows here. So the first two rows would be from trap. And, and, and I've also given you guys some old data, some example data that you don't need to look at, but just if you're curious. And so if you're wondering about how to fill this out, you can, you can look at that and sort of probably get a lot of your questions answered once you see um, a, an entered in data sheet. Um, but what I want to say here is um, let's start with, with our, our species richness right here, okay? So here's our label side of my first trap, and uh, I'm going to, um, uh, you know, say, oh, there, there, it looks like there's five five species on this side, or, or five types of critters on this side. Okay, 
All right, good. There might be 500 individuals on your trap, but I'm just counting the, the categories, right? The types. Okay, so it looks like there's, there's at least five different types of things here. Okay, so I'd put a five in this box. Then I would flip the trap over and do the same thing on the back side, okay? So the back side. Okay, this one looks like there's seven, let's say, different um, categories. Okay, cool. I put seven in. For most of what we're doing with your analysis, we're going to do the, the, the label side as one complete separate thing, and then the back side as one complete separate thing. Cool? The one difference, though, is uh, the species richness. So when we're counting the number of, of big fat moths that are on our, our trap, it's totally fine to count the number of moths on the label side and the amount of lot, lot, uh, moths on the back side. Because then, as you'll see over on the right, this, the data sheet will automatically count those together. Right? So if we had three on the back and one on the front, we would have a total of four moths in our trap. Make sense? Because the trap is creating a plane, and we're enumerating the number of organisms that came into contact with that plane. That's why we can do that. So the front and back is just a logistic thing for, to be easier for us to do the data collection. The one exception, and have a look right here, the one exception is the apparent species richness. So you should count them both, but if we had five species on the label side and seven apparent species on the back, the apparent species richness wouldn't be five plus seven, right? That doesn't work in that case because some of the categories that are on the label side might also be on the back side. So the one place that we actually, after you've counted the front and counted the back, then you're going to just do a you know, flip back and forth and, and, and come up with one number for both sides. And so because of that, if you notice here on the data sheet, there's a place to put apparent species richness for one of the columns, but the other one is blocked out. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. So then you're going to go and you're going to count how many reds, count how many um, uh, of, of these different size categories, and you're going to type those in. The other parts of the data sheet that I haven't mentioned are these peach colored or orange colored uh, areas. Those you don't need to do anything to. So there's formula in the, in the cells that calculate all the stuff for you. So the only thing you need to fill in again are the cells that are, that are empty, the cells that are blank. Okay, so let's talk about it. So what are these sizes? These sizes um, are the overall body um, size of the critter. So if it's bigger than 10 millimeters, if it's bigger than a centimeter, that, that, that we count the number of those individuals and put the tally in this box. Five to 10 millimeters is the other size class. Two to five millimeters is the even smaller one. And then we have a size category that says less than two millimeters, okay? So that would be critters smaller than two millimeters, but not these reds, right? So these reds are these, again, where I buzz my head and there's just these little flecks of things that look like hair or dust. That is not less than two millimeters. Th those are a separate category. So really, really the less than two millimeter is reds to two millimeters. But, but uh, uh, that, this is how we, over the years, this is how the students have liked to describe it. So in other words, we have these five different size categories and everything that's a, an animal on your, oops, did I do that? Everybody that's an animal on your um, trap is going to have to be in one of these five bins and only one of these five bins. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, the other, the, the, the la and then there's a part for comments. So you can put whatever comments you want in there. Uh, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, one other thing I, I wanted to, to um, note is uh, normally we don't we don't have this as a as a column, but actually have this as a column this time. And this is sticky trap area. If you look up here on the upper left, I've calculated the sticky trap area of our traps. Again, because we normally use the same traps year in year out, it, I historically just function factored that into the formula um, that you'll see in a second. But because we're using a different size trap. Um, uh, you guys want to use this this other size here. And since we do everything in, in square meters, um, I would go in here and I would type in 0 0.26 meters, right? So that, that's a full one of your traps that survive. Every once in a while, something goes wrong. This is field science, right? So sometimes your trap might fall in the dirt or something, right? And so, so or maybe as you're picking it up, um, you know, it, it fell in the dirt or something. 
uh, or maybe it broke. Sometimes they break. So we have had the case where the trap is pretty much intact, but it broke and part of the trap fell off onto the ground or, or something like that. Um, or a leaf blew and stuck onto part of the trap. And so, you know, we can't really use that. It wasn't collecting insects for the full five days or what have you. And so we just exclude that. In that case, what we do is we measure the amount of trap that, that broke off or that we're not counting, and we would calculate a new sticky trap area. So if you guys did have problems, you could adjust the area that you were actually sampling, but for just about everybody, you can use this default value and just put it in there. Um, the other one is this, uh, uh, your unique identifier, okay? So um, when we look at the data sheet in a second, I'll, I'll type in a few numbers and you'll see how this works, but, but that, that, that should be your unique identifier. So it's, it's you know, Sean01, you know, for my 01, uh, site, or maybe I'm calling it my Sean grass for my grass site or whatever it is, but you guys should have a unique identifier uh, label on that. Um, okay. Um, the last little thing is on the right, you'll see when we get to the, oh, sorry, then there's a comments. And so I'm going to put any of my comments. So if the trap did break, I would, I would put a comment in there. Oh, you know, the trap, trap had a lot of dust on it. Trap was, um, was cracked or, or, or something like that. I saw a big bird hovering around. And when I went out on day three, my moth was missing, you know, so, you know, something like that. Um, on the right hand side are some things that might be interesting for us to talk about as, as a class. Um, but these are conspicuous cat. These are either endangered species that we're really, really worried about or very, very obvious categories, things like dragonflies, things like mosquitoes that we might agree to. And then we could do a count just to sort of see how everybody's, you know, you know how those communities are going. Um, but because that is usually decided as the group, um, you know, and everybody's dispersed, it's a little hard to do. But you can see some of our historic categories. If you want to do that, if you're finding in particular getting a lot of ants or getting a lot of bees, or if we want to see how the, how the bee populations compare in our different sites, you know, we could do that. But that, that thing on the right is is more of a um, individual class, individual project by project um, categorization. Okay, let me show you guys what the data sheet looks like and then we can uh, take some questions. Um, okay, everybody, can, can everybody see this okay with me? Yeah, okay. So here we go. So, so if this was me and here's my, here's my sticky trap, I'm gonna, um, you know, say my name. Oop, I, I would have probably have to spell my name correctly. And then I'm going to enter it twice, right? And so, again, these first two rows, can you guys say make this bigger? Can you guys see this a little easier? Uh, so these first two rows, this would be one trap, right? So in my case, 9 and 10 is one single individual trap. I put the measure date, and that would be today's date or whatever the date that we ended up um, measuring it. Wait, is it 16th? I don't even know. I've been in quarantine land too long. Um, Oh, it's the seventeenth. Oh my God, my my uh, smarter person in the lab here is informing me how lame I am. Okay, date deploy. This is going to be the date that you put it out, the date that you wrote the name of on the trap. And I don't remember what mine was. I don't know, four ten or something. All right. Okay, and then days deployed. So hopefully it was five. If some, if something had a problem, that's okay. Oops, look at this lameness. Let's make this guy be. Mm -mm. I probably should have fixed this. How lame am I? Okay, so five days deployed in the community. So this would be some, some again, this is something that we would talk about if we were doing this as a group, but this would be, you know, my backyard, let's say. Or, or if we're doing this in, um, you know, the park, this would be, you know, regional park or something. So I'm going to put, so have a look here. Again, the, the, the peach color stuff, you do not need to do anything to. So here I'm going to call, maybe I'm going to call my backyard uh, Sean01. As soon as I hit return, this is going to start generating a unique identifier, right? So, so this, is, this is my Sean01 label data. And then this one is going to be my Sean01 back data, right? So again, you don't have to do any of this stuff. My area is 0 0.26 because I, oops, 0, 0.0. .0. Two, six. And again, if you don't remember what that is, that, that stuff is right here. The, and the traps you guys are using are the ones that were from Amazon. Okay. 
And then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna look and I do my counting. I'm gonna look up, and so if I just look over here to the right, everything is blank. Can you guys see? And there's over, if we scroll to the right, there's all this, all these calculations that look weird, either have zeros or have error-like uh, numbers in them. But I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say, maybe I had 20 reds on this side, maybe I had 15 on this side, maybe I had three on this, and maybe I had 10 on this or 12 or something. I had three and I had four and I had one and zero and maybe I had zero and two or something like that, right? Oh, sorry, I was also supposed to fill in my apparent species richness, I don't know, five and seven and or six. Um, the only thing you would want to double check yourself on this is um, as a quick double check visually or, or one thing that I do look at my, my students' data. Um, obviously, I can't know if, so th this could be, as much as 11, right? So, so if we had totally five unique categories on the backside and six unique on the front, that would probably never happen, but in theory it could. I'd get 11. But I would never be less than six, right? Because if we saw at least six categories on the back, there'd have to be at least six on the front. Does that make sense? I'm gonna type in my comments, type in this, but if, if I go over here, what we'll see is now um, on the far right after the main data entry area, uh, we have uh, both sides combined. And so this unique identifier says uh, Sean 01 both. And it's, it's summed the reds from both sides. It's given us a total count. It's, it's got our apparent richness. And then this number right here is looking at the relative distribution of critters. And, and you, do, you, you can choose to use this data. You can choose to ignore this data. This is just data for you to, to start to look at and to get a sense of. But... But in this case, this is looking at, at numerically the distribution. So are most of my organisms relatively small or big? This is saying that, um, that almost two thirds of my critters are those reds and very, very few, less than, or about 3% are a centimeter or bigger. This number here calculates the amount of fresh weight biomass. So the amount of grams of fresh weight of arthropod um, mass that existed on your trap that you collected. And so this is in grams. So we had 0 .000277 grams, et cetera. And we mentioned last time we calculated these from capturing lots of these insects and, and arthropods ourselves and killing them and weighing them. So, so for these kind of critters, it's very easy. For these guys, it's a huge pain in the butt. So you have to catch like a hundred to get a, a single weight of one. But um, anyway, so this is biomass. This is the same thing as before. This is, this is proportion from numbers. This is now proportion from biomass. So if we were to do the traditional taxonomic approach, right, this would say that um, the big story in my made up data set, my big story in this case is from the reds, right? The vast majority of things that we're encountering are little. But if you're doing an assessment for someone that has an endangered bird or, or a, a, a bird population they were trying to support, and these birds are eating these moths and, and big insects, you might come up and say, whoa, 90% of the biomass is coming from these larger bodied things. So yes, the systemicist, the, the insect uh, expert might say the story is really in the reds ecologically to support um, the, the ecological functioning that you might be uh, interested in characterizing, maybe it's one of these other ones, right? One of these other categories. And then lastly, the, 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 bi the total biomass just sums all this up. But then to have an apples to apples comparison, this takes that and divides that by the area. And so if we look at this, this formula, this takes, this takes this biomass and it divides it by the area that you've typed in and the number of days that you had the trap deployed. Cool. So, so the main focus here is on productivity. How productive is your backyard or are your, your collective backyards? And it'll be really interesting to see, particularly since some folks are in different parts of the state or people have different amounts of plant material and stuff in their backyard. It'll be really interesting to see if your, if your um, vegetative data tracks with this or does not. Um, so that's cool. Um, okay, so that's our sticky trap data. That, that, that's the most confusing um, I think data set or, or excuse me, data sheet because it's laid out. Again, uh, these are different bins that we've used. You could choose to use them, make your own up, whatever, or we could 
we could have a chat if you guys are all curious. Hey, I wonder if other people are getting bees, right? And we could just do simple bee numbers or types of, you know, honeybees or what have you. Um, if we flick over to Pitfall, this is a much more vanilla, plain looking um, data sheet. So we can do biomass for Pitfall as well. Um, and I'm, I'm totally down for you guys to try that. Because so many people are using, you know, vegetable oil and, and Everclear and stuff, I, I, I've not tried this. And so because we use standardized liquids throughout, I, I think we have a decent estimate how we traditionally do them. Um, you guys are welcome to, to do this part of the worksheet, but also it, it's, it's fine to ignore it. So this is, this is um, uh, just like before, it's, it's person's name, date, et cetera, the community, unique identifier. And then for this, this is um, uh, a, how we traditionally do this is we look at um, uh, groups. So usually it would be family or order, which is, which is um, you know, ladybugs, um, beetles, uh, dragonflies, stuff of that, you know, that level and, and how many um, individuals we get. Uh, if you look at this tab, I have our most common... I have our most common uh, critters that we've encountered over the years doing this exercise and in our local wetlands. So the sort of coastal, coastal plain critters from these traps, these are the orders that we typically get. And if you look in that, um, in the, uh, the guide, the, the Pirate Lab invert guide, that there'll be examples of all these things in here. So at a minimum, you guys should be able to do order, right? And even if you haven't done this ever before, spending half an hour, a couple hours, you'll be able to get order. This is not uh, that complicated. When we start to get lower to the family levels and, and, gene, and general levels, that gets more challenging. Um, and so it depends on the, the specific critters you have as to how easy or not easy that will be. But these are the, the traditional groups that we've had um, uh, in the past. But things like pill bugs, you know, everybody's gonna have some pill bugs. Everybody's gonna have some Argentine ants. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going on a limb and saying that, uh, and, and probably, uh, just about everybody will have a chance of at least encountering some, um, honeybees probably this time of year. We're, we're having a lot of swarming here in, in Ventura County. So, um, so there are a few things that you guys, uh, I, I could almost guarantee you'll get, but, um, but we will see. So how this is going to work is I'm going to fill this out. And because you guys might have one individual in your pitfall trap, one item, one, one animal, or you could have, I don't know, 300, right? This is an open-ended data sheet. So here I'm going to type in my info. I'm going to say this is Sean01 uh, or whatever, right? And fill out the rest of this stuff. But, but I might have three things here articulated. I might have, you know... 50 rows. So it's going to be, it's going to need to be very flexible, right? Does that make sense to you guys? And so how I'm going to do this is, um, if you look, I, one thing that we've historically done that you don't have to do, but I think might be helpful for you guys in thinking about stuff is talking about the food guild or the food niche that these guys are. Are these primarily herbivorous? Are they, are they getting their, their energy primarily from eating, uh, vegetation? Are they primarily eating dead stuff? Are they primarily, uh, predating on things or whatever? Um, and so if I had my predatory beetle, let's say, I would come in here, I would put that in here, I don't know the species, um, actually, sorry, I do in this case, so it would be like that, um, I'd fill it out, and then I'd say, how big is this dude? So this guy is, I don't know, five millimeters or something. And then were there many individuals that were, you know, about five millimeters of that? And if that's the case, and so you'll get this, for example, with Argentine ants. Like if the ants get into your trap, you probably didn't have one ant. You'll probably have, you know, 25, 30, 100, something of that nature. And so, um, so our swarming uh, or, or um, uh, pest type of critters in your backyard will tend to be really abundant. So in that case, I would put that there was however many there was. I saw 24 or whatever. I might make some note. Um, and I might say that these guys, what were these guys, what did I have these guys as? I have these guys as predators. So I'd come in here, I'd just say, ah, oh, these guys are probably a predator, right? And, and go from there. Uh, 
once we've gotten all these guys together, based on the size, you could also, again, try the biomass, but that's going to be really dependent on um, if you guys want to try that or not. So this is essentially enumerating the, the, the types of critters that we have, and, uh, and there we go from there.